Good evening, this is John Milburn for Laws 11057. Introduction to Law, we're into week 11 of Term 2, 2017. This is the week before the take-home exam. So while we're going to be talking about professional conduct, ethics and self-management as the official's themes, I imagine that people are very keen to talk about the examination. So let's open it up. Um, now, David, do you have a question about the exam? Yeah, I just want to ask, uh, with the exam, uh, will we be expected to sort of look for a lot of different sources outside the prescribed text in terms of answering the questions? And if so, do we have to reference them and do bibliographies and things like that? Or is that we only really need to keep it within their sources within the prescribed text? Or you want us to go outside of that? Okay. What we might do, David, that's a very good question. We might open that up for general comment. What does everyone think? I was under the impression that we were required to find external sources through the websites and whatnot relevant cases and legislation and that they were all supposed to be correctly referenced um, and the, yeah, basically legislation cases. Potentially you can use secondary sources, although I got the impression it wasn't extremely encouraged, but they are all expected to be properly referenced because this is a take home paper. So it's open book. You have all of the availability of the internet while you're working on it, as opposed to an invigilated exam where you've just got your head. Okay, now thank you for that contribution, Sarah. Any other thoughts on what it is that you think I would expect in terms of materials that you rely upon for this examination? Any other thoughts? I think so because, you mentioned, sorry, sorry, okay. We'll just go with um, Melissa, I think. Just beat your gay, Melissa. I think the whole um, test is to based on to see whether we can use our legal research toolkit that we've actually used. So it's to show that we can actually go and look for a source and, and be able to present it and then reference it properly and making sure that it's appropriate to our answer. Yep, thank you for that contribution, Melissa. Gay, what do you think? Hi everyone, I've only just turned it on so I actually don't know, I, I, I've only just been in here for about 10 seconds. Okay, no that's fine, sorry. Um, all right. So I had Any a other... question, sorry, that's uh, kind of related to that. All right, so we do, at the moment um, we're looking for, I guess, responses to David's question. So Yeah, is it... it is a response to his Great. question, it's related Thanks, to that. Um, so I was just wanted to know, in specifically in relation to that, um, my understanding was that we that the exam, even though it's a take home exam and we have you know thirty six hours or whatever for it to do it, that it was still that it was still somewhat the equivalent of a three hour exam. Is that correct? And if so, um, referencing <laughs> when I did referencing for my assignments, it actually took up a really big chunk of time just getting all the references down and getting it all right. So I'm just wondering how to what extent that can actually be a possibility within a three hour exam. Thanks Andari, we'll, we'll take that on board. We'll come back to that as well. Any other thoughts? So the, the question under discussion is, to what ex extent do you think I would want you to research and rely upon material? And to what extent would you think I want you to reference that material? So we've had some thoughts from Sarah. John, I, I think yes, we're Nicole. going to we're going to have to reference the material, even if it even if the information that we used is the examples um, prescribed in the textbook. Not every case that's listed in the textbook um, is going to be uh, referenced in AGLC. So you're going to have to go and find the case and make sure you get the correct, correct reference in AGLC style to put it into your footnotes anyway. Otherwise, what's the point in putting the reference in the documentation? You're not providing the correct information as to where somebody else can validate that what you're saying is correct from a professional standpoint. Okay. Thank you for that contribution, Nicholas. Any other thoughts? Jess, do you have something? Yeah. I was under the impression that you wanted it done as in we were graduated law school and practicing lawyers and to do our work in a professional manner. Yep, great. Thank you, Jess, for that contribution. Tracy, did you wish to add something? John, that's what I was going to say, just in a professional manner, the way that you've explained it to us. Okay, good. Um, 
All right, any other thoughts? Jackie says, I had a barrister provide me with their opinion in a case for work. Well, that's handy. Do you want to tell us more about that, Jackie? And they provided footnote referencing. Do you, would you like to expand on that, Jackie? No? All right, so Jackie um, was referring to a real-life situation and footnote referencing from case law. Uh, thank you, Jackie. All right, well, look, let's take into account all of those things. Good question, David. Do you have a response to any of that, David, before we, I, give you, I give you my thoughts? Uh, yeah, I do understand that about referencing case law. That's, goes, that's obvious, but I was more thinking if this requires referencing from other sources other than just, you know, referencing for cases and things like that. In that case, I wanted to know how much of an academic paper this was going to be or whether it's going to be more of like a professional presentation because the other thing too is I've actually been looking at examples of memorandums of advice and they seem to have certain patterns the way they're actually written out and I was wondering if that's more the approach that we should be taking. Yes, um, and, and there are some statements of advice or opinions or memorandums of advice that you can access and I'll... I will see if I've got some that I might be able to provide to you. Okay, well, here's, here's my thoughts, and I'm taking into account what Sundari said as well. We have given you, as I recall, from 7 a.m. on Tuesday morning until 5 p.m. on Wednesday evening. Correct me if I'm wrong with those assessments. So we'll meet next Monday. We'll have a last-minute chat, and then the next morning, bright and early, I'll release the paper. I do expect you to do more than you would in an invigilated exam. I think Sarah made the point that in an invigilated exam, you walk in quite often. When I was doing law, it was closed book exam. From memory, you didn't have resources. Invigilated exams now are typically open book, but it's handwritten. You don't have much chance. The idea of the take-home exam is that we give you a, a window. In theory, you should be able to produce the work in three hours but can I say this, we're in a transition stage and because we've given you a much broader window, I expect that some students will spend much more than three hours. If that's all you've got, that should be sufficient. But of course, I, I'm not in a position to prescribe that you have an honesty situation that you only use three hours. If you want to use all of the time, then that's a matter for you. So what do we expect? Um, I do expect you to reference your material. By that I mean use footnote referencing. Um, in looking at the second assessment, I could see that some people still haven't got the idea of footnote referencing. To me, it's dead easy in this sense, and I'm taking on board what you said, Sundari, but it's dead easy in this sense in that in a Word document, you simply go to the ribbon at the top that says, I think, referencing, click that, and then go to insert footnote, click that, and bang, it's already done. So if you're referring to um, a quote from a case or you're referring to a piece of legislation, identifying the case or the piece of legislation by way of footnote reference, to me, is really simple exercise. Um, if you're going to refer to a secondary source, such as a textbook, which you're perfectly entitled to do, then again, refer to the name of the author and um, and the, and the page number. If you use that insert footnote reference guide, that shouldn't take you too long. Now, what I don't need you to do, what you really, you can do it if you like, but you don't get any extra credit for it and you're not penalised if you fail to do it. I don't need you to provide a bibliography, not for this work. So my criteria is footnote referencing. If you want to do a bibliography, fine, but you don't have to do that. So anything that you refer to should be in the footnote reference. And the, the reason I do that is that's consistent with legal practice. If you get a, an opinion from a barrister, it will be referenced, but, uh, but it will typically be only footnote referenced and not the bibliography. Now, just I have on that point, Sundari, does that make it easier for you to look at the issue of referencing your material? Um. It was not so, I mean, I've, I've used Word a lot, so actually creating footnotes in Word was, is, yes, really simple in terms of creating 
the place where you put it. The thing that took the time for me was um, getting all of the information correct in the correct formatting, in the correct order, it's with all the correct grammar, etc. cetera. Um, getting from different sources, some sources it's, it's more difficult to find the, um, the referencing information, other, other sources, some sources are really easy like our textbook. Um, so that's what, that's what took a lot of time for me. So I actually spent, you know, over an hour, I think, getting all of the footnotes um, correct in our last, in my last assignment. Um, and so that's why I was kind of thinking, well, if we have to do the same thing in a three hour exam, that's, then I'll have to take that into account and only spend two hours doing the actual assignment. Um, and yeah, it was just, it's just a matter of clarity and just figuring out what you're actually expecting and working out how to spend what time. Yeah, sure. Okay. All right. Um, Nicholas, I think you've got something you wish to add. You've yeah, I was just going to say, I just put up a link to a resource called Cite This For Me. Now, it is free. You can get a free account. It doesn't cost anything. And when you go in there, um, and I don't know if John wants to bring it up and have a quick look at it, um, it allows you to um, just click on a button that says website, journal article, book, and then there's an option that says more. Uh, that allows you to do artworks, blogs, broadcasts, court cases, dictionaries, dissertations, whatever. And basically, you just click on the link and it just asks you to put the information in um, and it formats it automatically for you based on the style that you choose. Um, and I think the second tab across, by default, it says uh, citation style is Harvard. But if you click on the drop down list, you can just type in the search box AGLC and change your entire referencing for everything to AGLC style, and it will automatically do it for you. And it's free, right? It means you can get it perfect every time. Wow, that sounds great, Nicholas. Um, I must confess, I'm not at all. I'm not familiar with that. It does sound like a terrific resource. If you have an opportunity to uh, um, draw, bring that up on on your screen, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you can share the screen from your end and we could have a look at that. Yeah, I can. Uh, let me just find but it. Only if it's... Yeah, yeah, no, I'll make it's sure... It's not inconvenient. The... No, it's or... not inconvenient. I'll just make sure I get the right screen open. Uh... Sundari, does that sound like that would help? Um, I tried it. I actually went to that site and I tried it, um, but I obviously didn't find the AGLC, AGL, yeah. Okay. The option um, so every option that came up for me was not um, I had to reformat anyway okay so, right, it's interesting yeah, with discussion. Might be awesome. uh, I can see that uh, Nicholas has brought it up on the screen so do you want to take us through it Nicholas yeah all right so I'm at site this for me.com and I've put the link up in the um, in the chat as well so the first thing everybody needs to do when they come in here which is where they get confused is you need to go into this section that says citation style in here and you need to change this to AGLC. So just type in AGLC and then click on Australian Legal Guide and it will actually change the style. You'll notice now that the style has changed. And then from there, you can just on the far left hand side, if you want to do a website or a journal or a book, um, as an example, like if you clicked on book, um, what you do is just find the ISBN number and type it in and just click on search and it pulls up all the details automatically for you. Like you can't get it wrong. Um, once that's done, uh, the other option, if I just click out of there for a minute and close the, the button, my net's gone a bit slow. Um, the other option after that is a couple of other pages where you can do um, other referencing. So under more here, I don't know if you can see it in the drop down list. Uh, there is court cases. There are dissertations. There are, look, uh, PDFs and books, edited books, emails, government publications, interviews, journals, legislation. It's all there. Everything you need to do it correctly. And as I said, it's a completely free source. Um, they do have a paid resource, and it says over here that they'll do plagiarism detection and so on. Um, the only thing is, when you do this, um, you're limited to 20 resources per the bibliography. Now, it says your bibliography, but you can change this. And the idea is that um, it will give you uh, the information you need. So if I were to do a, uh, a 
well, I don't know, let's say a court case, um, if you can find one, you'll see what it does is it wants you to put in the case name, drop down list for the year it was published, any volume number. So any of the information that you get out of the reports when you're citing them, you just put that information in and then click add reference and it will go through, and I haven't put anything into this one, obviously, but you'll see what it does is it'll say footnote, and it'll give you the exact data you need to put in a footnote and the exact data you need to put in a bibliography, and you can just literally copy and paste it straight into your document. It can't be much easier than that, and you'll get it precise every time. Thank you very much, Nicholas. You're getting some fans, I can see, on the chat facility. <laughs> well done. <laughs> That's excellent, including me. That's um, a great resource. Okay, well, I hope that helps. And thank you for introducing me to that. All right. As a That's side great. note, Site This to Me has an app for those who use Apple tablets and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> I found it ages ago, but I don't use it very often because I'm typically, I typically write all my citations out as I'm making notes, so I do it by hand. But it is available. All right. Thank you very much. Excellent. So, in terms of footnote referencing, if you're referring to a case, there's um, uh, the matter is set out in the AGLC, as is the case for um, publications, etc. All right. So, and my main priority is to ensure that if you have drawn material from an external source, you acknowledge it. Um, but I would like you to footnote properly. And part of the reason is that when you move into second year, I would like to think that as a cohort, you are very confident with your abilities in legal research, you're very confident in the way in which you set out your material, and you're confident in relation to referencing your material. So that, um, that'll hand you in good stead. When the work is presented in second and third year, people will think very highly of you even before they've read the material, just by looking at it. Um, Sarah. Um, I just remembered something I thought I'd better ask because I've had courses where it is a thing. Is there a required limited amount of research references? Like, are we supposed to have a minimum of eight, or is it doesn't matter? No, it doesn't matter. No, um, if you, if if you, you know, I think you can possibly over resource. You can over reference the material. For example, uh, uh, this, if you state a proposition of law, then I don't want you to reference ten cases as authority for that proposition. Select the main case the most authoritative case and um, use that as your reference. So don't don't give me eight, give me one case, but reference it correctly. I hope that answers your question, Sarah, but other than that, there is no minimum, there is no maximum per se. I don't know if it'll be helpful to others, um, for those that are familiar with um, resources like Excel spreadsheets. But what I've been doing is, as I've been going through, um, I've created an Excel spreadsheet that has um, sections in it, like as in civil law, administrative law, tort law, whatever it is. Um, and every time I've come across a case where the reading is in reference to that type of law and it's a primary case, I've whacked it into a spreadsheet. So the next time I need to find out any information within there, I've got all the prima facie cases just listed directly and I can use them as the bounce off point for anything else. Great idea. Sounds very good. Um, now, David, this all started with your question. I'm not sure if we're going any closer to answering the question. Um, we've identified that the, the theory is three hours to do the work, but in reality, I expect people will spend more time than that, but I don't want to penalise people that just don't have the time. I understand, but it's the way it is. I can say that it's very likely that in future offerings of this and other courses, the time will be limited um, to a much greater extent. And it may be that we'll work, to work towards having a three hour uh, time slot online and that's it. So in the, it, it will become more and more like an invigilated exam. So we're working towards that. So at the moment, it's a bit of a transition. So you're not saying from the time we open this, let's say we open it at seven, that we've got to have it back within three hours, are you? You're saying not that... Not at all. It, no. it suggested that we could complete it within that time, but if we take right up till five o'clock the next day, then that's fine. That's absolutely fine. If you don't want to sleep on Monday night and you just want to keep working on it, that's entirely up to you. 
If you want to spend an hour on it, that's entirely up to you as well. Can, can I just ask uh, what may be a stupid question, but once we open it up and it's released, uh, we can sort of like have a look at it, even walk away from the computer, have a look at it several hours later. It's not something that once you open up, it has to be completed. It's like, yep, absolutely. Yeah, okay. you absolutely so, you can do that. Look, so, it's intended to be, to some degree, realistic. And, um, uh, you know, you can, you can collaborate on it as well. It's not a group assignment, but I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that I and understand that people will talk. So, and it's a way of forming relationships as well. Now, people may say that's terribly unfair because I've got nobody to talk to about it, but um, it's got to be your work. But I understand the nature of the examination process is such that people do talk. Oh, there's plenty of AIs to talk to out there, John. All those legal <laughs> databases have AIs yeah. that can communicate with you about what's going on. Look, the other, the other question I had about that, um, and David was just saying once you open it, is the question itself going to be in a downloadable format that we can download to our computer and read it, or is it just going to be on Moodle that we have to read it from Moodle itself? No, it should be downloadable. Um, has And I, should, I think that should be the case with the previous assessments. So I will provide the content on Moodle, but I'll also provide a PDF probably of the uh, document as well. That would be great because the reason why I was actually asking my question just before Nicholas is that I'm potentially maybe going, I live within walking distance of the Queensland State Library and I was thinking about maybe downloading something, printing it out on a piece of paper at home and then just taking that with me to the library so I've got that as a reference point. That's why I I was uh, yeah curious about that one. Absolutely. And David, just out of interest, are you going to the Queensland State Library? Yes. You're not going to the to the Supreme Court Library? Uh, well, no, I haven't been going to the Queen, the Supreme Court Library because the hours are different to the State Library and I work full time, so I, it's very difficult for me to get an opportunity to do that. So I have oh. to kind of, yeah. When, you, when, you, when you're admitted, you get an after-hours pass, so you can go whenever you like. But uh, okay. yeah, I understand. So if you are close to the city, as I am at the moment, um, you can go to the Supreme Court Library within those hours. All right. So are we getting closer to answering those questions? We've got an idea of what, I, what you expect from me. Um, I guess coming back to the original comment, it's pretty obvious that I would want you to go more than the textbook. If you're just relying on the textbook, that's not going to work. The comments were correct when they said that um, the exercise involves practical use of your toolkit. It involves practical application of the research skills that you've learned for the online platforms. And it's a matter of you piecing it together. Now, in terms of the logic that you apply, that's where there's a considerable degree of personal taste and that's where the way in which you structured your toolkit should reflect the way in which you go about finalising an answer to this question. Anybody have any questions or comments about what I've just said? No, I'm sure you get the same comments next, uh, next Monday as well, John, just before the panic sets in. Yeah, I think so. All right, well, we might stop the discussion there. I'll take on board the suggestion that perhaps we could uh, find something to provide you as a comparison, as a pro forma, but um, I'll, I'll have to think about that. But really, it's a matter of you developing something for yourself. Now, I should also mention that the second assessment, I released the results this afternoon. Have you seen those results? Did you see the papers come through? All right. So, what you'll see in that is that overall, the average for the class is less than the average than it was for the first assessment. That's entirely predictable. The first assessment was really quite simple. It didn't take much to get a good score. You had to work harder to get a good score for the second assessment, and you're going to have to work harder again to get a good score on the third assessment. So assessments two and three, we're really starting to spread the field a bit in terms of where people sit. Um, but overall, I was very happy with the work for the, the second assessment. This group is really doing well. I've mentioned that a few times, and I'm not just saying it, I really mean it. So you, uh, you should make good contacts with each other, 
and uh, continue to uh, to assist each other in the way that you're doing. Some really good contributions from students this term. So the work overall was very good. And um, please, if you haven't already done so, have your say. Um, I do need you to do that. It's, it's uh, important for the university. It's important for me. All right. If you have any questions about the second assessment, you can email me or you can ask through UCRU. Now, professional conduct. So, Chapter 13 deals with professional ethical behaviour. You must refer to the ethical issues when you're dealing with legal situations. And I would like you to read pages three, sorry, 435 through to 455 for general interest and context. I'm going to read a quote in terms of ethics for you because I think this encapsulates where we're at. This is from a decision in uh, New South Wales 2011. It's called McLaughlin against Dungarran Manley, PDYLTD. And the citation is 2011 NSW SC 717 at, paid, at paragraph 30. And the court said, it needs to be emphasised that the efficient conduct of commercial litigation, indeed all litigation, can only be assisted by restraint, moderation, sensible cooperation and sound judgment. Indeed, the due administration of justice demands it, and it's part of the wider duty to the court. What that tells me then is that you must always consider your role within the administration of justice and your duty to the court as paramount. That is a clear obligation under the uh, uh, Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules and the Barrister's Rule, and it's emphasised by the court process. The courts want you to litigate, litigate well, but do so with some degree of restraint, moderation, sensible cooperation and sound judgment. So the court is saying, don't, don't take the cheap shots. Um, make sure that within the, the bounds of acting to the best interest of your client, that you provide some degree of cooperation and sound judgment. So another ethics tip Retired General John Cantwell said that with respect to leadership, good leaders take time for reflection. When concerned by an ethical dilemma or problem, taking time to reflect and think ahead is important. The same applies to lawyers. So in the context of any practice that you may have in law, you need to take a moment, think carefully about the ramifications, and then be prepared to ask questions of others in the profession or uh, ethics counsellors. However, most of the time, the way you feel about the situation, your gut feel, for use of a better, for want of a better term, is the appropriate way to consider it. I trust that you've all had a chance to look at the video by His Honour Judge Morzone and uh, read his material, which I um, understand was not accessible immediately on Moodle, but I've um, put it on to Moodle or, and or you crew, so you should be able to see that. I'm going to urge you to look at the Queensland Law Society website, and in particular the Ethics Centre. It's a very valuable resource, and what I'm going to attempt to do now is to share the screen uh, so that we can have a look at that um, resource you should now be able to see my screen. Is that what's coming through? If you can just give me a thumbs up, David. I can see you on screen. That's coming through, all right. Sorry, that's the Legal Services Commission. That's the other one that I want to uh, look at. We'll look at the Queensland Law Society Ethics Centre. And you'll see here, bottom right-hand corner, or mid-bottom, uh, QLS Ethics Centre. Click on that fabulous resource in terms of material put together by Stafford Shepherd, who is, an, is a legend. And um, you can contact the Ethics Centre or you can email the Ethics Centre. Uh, you've got the Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules. You've got ethics resources and you've got up-to-date quotes, news updates um, and guidance statements. So the guidance statements are very valuable and you can obtain non-binding rulings. Now, if you look over here at the ethics resources, you'll find information about specific topics. So if you want a general statement about the duty to the court, click on that link. It will take you to the relevant rule. 
it will provide you with information about relevant guidance statements, and it will go on from that to provide additional resources. So it's a wonderful um, resource that's available to you. And another good thing about quoting material from the Ethics Centre is that it's highly regarded and authoritative. So even though it's a secondary source, it's a secondary source that must be considered very carefully and, um, and it will um, hold you in good stead to refer to it. Again, not just in this course, but all of your courses throughout the university degree, if you can quote material from the um, conduct rules, if you can quote material from the guidance statements, the Law Society, the Bar Association, it will show a depth of uh, understanding, reading, that will um, impress the person that is um, marking your paper. So that's the um, Queensland Law Society Ethics Centre. The other one, we talked about it last week briefly, but I don't think I showed you the website. The Legal Services Commission, um, this looks at things from a different perspective. It's not so much directed towards the practitioner. It's generally more directed towards the uh, consumer. So you look at ethical issues from different perspectives on the Law Society site and the Legal Services Commission site. Now, they're valuable resources that I think you should take advantage of, and they're readily available. Any questions about those things? I was just going to say that um, I joined the QLS. It doesn't cost much money to join as a student member, and you get a newsletter emailed to you every week, and they actually always have a quite, an ethics quote in there as well that they provide. Uh, it's really handy website. That's great. And I absolutely urge all of you to take David's lead and join the Queensland Law Society as a student member. Excellent. And it helps to ingrain you as uh, part of the profession. So Catherine joined as well, and it was very reasonable. That's excellent. All right. Um, in terms of ethics, look at page 456 of your text. Think about your duty as a lawyer to the court, to the client, to colleagues. But don't forget about the obligations that you have to your family and to your employer. Sometimes people in practice get too much caught up with doing things right for the client. You've got to think about your boss and you've got to think about your family and keep things in some degree of balance here. And importantly, which is following on as the next chapter, you've got to look after yourself and remember that all of these things about doing the right job is subject to resilience and uh, keeping yourself fit and healthy. Last week, I mentioned some of the provisions in the Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules, and um, hopefully you've had a chance to read through those and read through the Barrister's Rule as well. Are there any questions about the Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules or the Barrister's Rule, particularly how to access them or how to receive uh, or how to understand them? All good. I'm looking to see if there's anything on the chat facility. I can't see anything at this stage. But, um, yep. All right. So, um, I mentioned last week some of the rules that you need to consider. I won't go through those again. Um, but you need to be aware of the advocacy rules, the rules about duty to the court, the client, and the responsible use of court processes, as well as the general ethical obligations that might be imposed on you. Rule three in the Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rule is a very important one because it talks about the administration of justice being paramount, and that's an important thing to keep in, mind, in the back of your mind uh, as a fallback position in relation to many issues that uh, you may come across. Okay, um, what I want to do now is just briefly deal with an issue of the first steps in litigation. So when you're looking at a litigation exercise, one thing that's very easily overlooked, I'm not saying this is on the exam, but one thing that's very easily overlooked is the statute of limitation. Or the question is a, a debt, for example, statute barred. 
Does anyone know what that means? Statute of limitation, is that the time frame in which you can actually lodge the claim in? Exactly. And why would that be relevant as the first thing to consider? Because if you missed a date, then you wouldn't be able to actually put the claim in for your client. Exactly. Um, or you need to seek leave to file out of date. So it's a preliminary point. In other words, you could spend 30 pages, not that I want you to do that, but you could spend 30 pages on a, a wonderful opinion, only to find that um, you can't get your foot in the door. So considering the statute of limitations is fundamentally important. And I will try to um, provide you with some more guidance in that regard, some more specifics, so that uh, for different areas you're aware of it. So you need to know whether your claim for, say, a breach of contract or a failure to comply with the Australian consumer law or whatever it might be is subject to you litigating within a certain period of time. When it comes to litigation, what's usually the first step for, a, for a, let's say, a solicitor? After you've taken instructions and you've decided that you wish to advance your client's cause, what, do the, what does the solicitor normally do first up? Is it the letter of demand? That's it, yes. So sometimes I see one answer is file a statement of claim, but you must send the letter of demand because that will have a cost ramification. In other words, if you embark on litigation immediately and the other side say, yes, you're absolutely right, here's um, the full payment, but I'm not paying your costs, you'll, you'll probably have a great deal of difficulty in recovering those costs because the court will say, well, you should have made the demand first because they uh, may well have just simply paid on that demand. You didn't have to go to the trouble of, um, of filing material. In a civil matter, what type of sorry, what type of court proceedings would we normally expect to see initiate some uh, process? There are basically two types. Okay, statement and cla of claim and claim. Yes, that's one. We put them in the one category. But that's right, Melissa, thank you. What's the alternative? to commencing proceedings with a statement of claim and claim. Application, initiating application, that's it. All right, so when you're dealing with a civil matter, you need to consider whether you file with a claim or an application, initiating application. Where do you look to find that information? We've mentioned it a few times during class. That's it, the Uniform Civil Procedure Rules, the UCPR. You can go to the court website and that will probably direct you to the UCPR. But bear in mind, of course, that what we want you to do is, wherever possible, refer to the primary source of law rather than the secondary source of law. So the court website would be a good example of a secondary source of law, but the UCPR is the primary source of law and the preferred one to cite. Before you initiate proceedings, you need to consider the jurisdiction of the court. Courts have different jurisdiction, different abilities to deal with certain matters. We talked about that last week. Uh, sometimes there's a monetary value that you need to consider as well. Sometimes you need to file in the appropriate geographical jurisdiction. So all of these things have a bearing on it. Once you've filed your material, what's the next step? Once you've filed your proceedings, what do you have to do? See, this is a real crash course, course in civil procedure. Any thoughts? Sorry, Move only it. that... This <laughs> yeah, sorry, Gay. Only that my thought is that this is what's scaring me, that am I supposed to, like, 
how, how in depth am I really supposed to understand this? Because I think Melissa has the jump on us a little bit because she works in a solicitor's office. So Yeah, she's getting a lot of these answers, right? That's good. No, you don't need to know it in a great deal of depth. Um, but what I want you to do is leave this course knowing where to research and just having a basic idea of the appropriate steps or more particularly where to look for the appropriate steps. So, and most of it's logical, isn't it? So, say in a civil proceeding, you, you write a letter of demand, you then file an application or a claim, and you serve it. Um, and there's a question about whether we're expected to use Queensland legislation as opposed to material. No, I'm very happy for you to use material from your own state. Or jurisdiction. I want this to be as practical for you as possible. So even if I make a statement about a geographical issue, you can make an appropriate change to reflect something that works in your area. So if I said Rockhampton, feel free to say, well, let's just make that Geelong. You know, that doesn't matter to me. Um, so, and I'll, but I want you to, to learn something that really means something to you. I hope that helps. All right, so once you've served the material, what if you're on the other side? You've received this material, a client comes in and says, I've been served with this claim or this application. What, what would you normally do? So let's say in a claim, what would you do? File a defence, yep. Okay. Um, possibly even a counterclaim. And then you need to remember that there could be some court processes involved in the um, procedure. So you may have to consider mediation and whether that is compulsory or whether it's something that you would just ask your client to consider for the sake of providing holistic advice and balanced advice. So, Gay, don't be too concerned. I don't need you to know a lot of detail but just have an idea of where to look and some idea of the uh, uh, procedures. Melissa, is there anything else that I should add for the sake of completeness? No, I don't think so. I think that's the first steps to take. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, in this course, I had to, I've put a great emphasis on legal research. It meant that I had to chop a few things down. One of those things is redrafting. So I think you know that I really have an aversion to legalese. That I call it gobbledygook. You know, just this nonsense of talking with long sentences and using officious language. So I'm really pleased to see that people are writing in a very sensible clear style using short sentences not using words like here and before and, and things of that nature so i think that we can probably gloss over the redrafting exercise that i would normally do it this week um, in the knowledge that uh, you'll be aware of of how to write clearly naturally and um, uh, in a manner that people can understand so let's move on to self-management which is chapter 10 of your text. And in particular, uh, there's pages 343 through to 371. We talked about this in week one. I said, um, you'll need to look after your mental health, your physical well-being. I warned you that you will be under pressure, but I want you to revel in that pressure. Sometimes even knowing that others are under pressure as well can help. So don't be afraid to say, I'm having trouble, I'm finding it difficult, and, and people are doing that. You're saying, hey, how's everyone else doing? Sometimes you'll find that others are in the same boat. Others will say, no, doing it pretty easy, how can I help you? Make sure that you look after your lifestyle, what you eat, how you look after your health is all very important. And really importantly is this, and I hope that you're learning this through the feedback that I give, particularly the second assessment, it won't always be positive feedback. Don't expect positive feedback all the time and be prepared to take it in your stride. Remember the big picture and take the feedback for what it is an opportunity to learn. I get feedback 
because people have their say. So that's an opportunity for me to learn as well. So it's a two-way street. And remember, of course, you need to be resilient and know, try to develop a do-it-now type attitude, but by the same token, be prepared to take your time where required uh, and to look after yourself. But resilience is really important in law. And I think you'll recall from week one, I gave you the indication as to um, how law students cope in terms of or what pressure law students feel compared to others, and in particular in, uh, in practice as well. All right, I know that's a really flying run through of chapter 10. That's probably all I uh, propose to talk about tonight so that you can start doing some more research. Are there any questions before we wrap things up? Any comments? All good? All right. How are we all feeling about the exam? We'll be right. Don't panic too much about it. We'll talk more about the exam next week. But it sounds like you're doing well. Scared? Yeah, that's fine. You can be scared. <laughs> John, yes, can Nicholas? I just confirm something? <clears throat> Obviously, through um, throughout the course, we've had to submit assignment material. So when it comes to our overall um, grade for the subject matter, is it a case of you then going through and adding up all of the um, results that we've got and then working out what percentage it is out of 100 that gives us our mark or is it based on the uh, an individual section and then you add them up? I mean, how do you work out what the overall oh, grade's going to be? That's a really good question. Um, no, it's, it's, it's a very simple exercise. I take the mark that you receive for assessment one, add it to the mark that you receive from assessment two, then add your mark for the take-home exam. So if, for example, that comes in at 75, 75 out of 100, that would put you into the category of distinction. So as I recall, 75 to 84 is distinction. 85 through to 100 is high distinction, or strictly 84 and a half, because we round up. If you get 50%, if you get 50 out or more, then that will be a pass. Um, through to 64. If you get 64.5 through to 74, that will be a credit. So it's just me adding it up. Does that answer your question, Nicholas? Yeah, so you add up the all scores all scores, and then just divide that by out of 100 is what we get, basically. Yeah, that's it. So 20 for the first assessment, 40 for the second assessment, and 40 for the take-home exam makes up the 100, and um, a pass is 50%. If you get 50%, so some of you, uh, just add what you've got for assessment one, assessment two, and you're almost going to be there. You know, when I say almost, if, you, if you're sitting on 35 or 40, you haven't got many to go to get to 50. So you don't have to stress too much about the final exam in terms of passing. Yeah, and I just put up, a link there, John, from CQU that gives you all those stats and numbers for HDs and ODs and Cs and Ps and everything else is there. So maybe that'll help a few. Oh, great. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. All right. Any other questions, comments before we wrap up for tonight? All good? All right. Well, look, thank you very much for attending. Um, I'm really pleased to see that people sometimes get online early and uh, have a chat uh, so feel free to do that and um, have your own meetings as well okay well i'll end the meeting now we'll see you next week all the best bye <laughs>